So then, so when we won in court on the first level, then the judge ruled. Um, then the city began negotiating with us, and there was a changeover in the administration of the city. And one of the neat things that happened when the administration changed over is that the new people in charge of the Department of Health and they wanted to get back at the people who came before them and to make it seem that they really were not going to be the same. So they just spilled like all this information about it. it in a way, it's like the Monsanto papers today, which is a lot more detailed and a lot more horrible. But they, they just told us they would come to meetings and talk to everybody about the evils of the previous Department of Health. You know, and you don't think of politics being played out that way in the health department. Then it turned out that, so we began negotiating a settlement. It also turned out, this is happening because 2001, 9-11 happened two years after the spring. And so there's a whole lead up into 2001, which is relevant. And so after 2001, the spraying was done in New York City by the Office of Emergency Management, not the Department of Health. Office of Emergency Management was headed by a guy named Jerome Hauer, who was, and it was situated in World Trade Center number seven, which was Giuliani's bunker, if you remember back then. Nobody was allowed to go in. Nobody was allowed to see anything. Uh, it was like secret, although everybody knew it. Inside, what I didn't know at the time was inside World Trade Center 7 was the largest CIA offices in the country outside of Langley, Virginia. Who knew? Who knew what the intersections were? I still don't know a lot of it, but I could guess. And so when the towers collapsed, well, before the towers collapsed, we were able to go in to the bunker in order to present them with a lawsuit because they weren't releasing any information under the Freedom of Information Act. And they were refusing, so we had to go back to court on that. And then we had to go present them with the subpoena and all that. So our lawyer, Joel Kupferman, went in with one of our members, Robert Letterman, who was one of the founding members of the No Spray Coalition. He's an artist. And they went in and they, Robert looked around and Robert was like me, very irreverent, not wanting to listen to authority at all, uh, not even questioning authority. We need to challenge authority. <laughs> and, he, and so when they got back, Joel gets a call on his phone from the Office of Emergency Management personnel who were livid because they found all these stickers pasted underneath the seats and all over the desks the garbage that Robert Letterman had I shouldn't even say that probably, but I guess Robert doesn't live in New York City anymore. <laughs> and he just pasted these stickers all over and they were threatening Joel's license. And you know, over a little thing, you never know what a little thing is gonna trigger other things. And so they were, and then so Robert Letterman started getting arrested everywhere for his portrayal of Giuliani as a, as uh, Adolf Hitler. He was a painter and he made these great big paintings that he did over and over again for different protests. And he had a special interest in this because he supported Giuliani. He had voted for him. And he was feeling betrayed, both personally as well as politically. So, so you never know. I, so I learned never to write anybody off. It's one thing to write off corporations and the people, not the people, but the companies that are in it for the profit, but you know, for conquest or empire or whatever. But individuals, I believe that individuals can come around, not necessarily through knowledge, but by just that feeling of being lied to, the feeling that everything you've done now is a lie by the people who are putting you down. So the Office of Emergency Management became the paradigm for what later was to become, just uh, two years later, Homeland Security. So, sweeps right into it. So, Homeland Security, all the same people involved, the, the laws that passed, the Patriot Act, the Homeland Security Act, all were written before 
They were just waiting, and there were a couple of others too, just waiting for the right moment to be enacted, this repressive thing on civil liberties in the United States. And they used this spring in New York as the model for what they then did all over the country, not only about spraying, obviously, but about everything. Same people, Jerome Hauer became part of that. Uh, same people involved, same way of setting it up, everything. So when we learn that, then we think of the spraying as possibly planning for what they were going to do later. Don't know how much they thought of it in advance, but it certainly became that way afterwards. So reading backwards, it looks like they, you know, this is all part of the plan in a way. They didn't have to spray. I mean, some people thought you needed to spray, but others were doing their own agenda at the same time. So they were parallel. So, yeah, so this was going on and on in New York. And a year later, we signed in this consent agreement where we, we traded money in our negotiating with the city because, again, it was a new administration. And... They were willing to do that. They didn't want to pay out the money. That's all they were concerned about from the city budget. And we couldn't get money under you sue on the Clean Water Act. You can't get money for yourself. So we got it to other groups. We, we wanted little groups all over the New York to be able to get whatever money we could get, which wasn't a hell of a lot. It was like $85,000 eventually. But it, we use that as seed money for all these little groups concerned with water projects. And year, a couple of years later, that seed money was used to launch the anti-fracking movement, hydrofracking in New York, <laughs> through these little groups. And it was incredible. It was so one thing leads to another, and you never know. Who knew that we're going to be fracking? So yeah. So I guess that. Oh, so in. Uh, so in the settlement, the city, we traded off money, so we didn't ask for as much, for political, uh, what do you call it, agreement of some sort, political concessions. And then, so here's the city agreed. It's in writing, in the, although nobody looks at it anymore in the city, that they admit that the stuff doesn't break down in the time period that he said it does, that it does, in fact, impact animal life, that it, and there were like four of that the mosquitoes come back stronger after the spraying because it kills off the natural predators of mosquitoes like bats and dragonflies and uh, a bat a bat i learned this in the course of it can eat one bat can eat 1500 mosquitoes in an hour <laughs> like where this little bat but so if you have so in houston texas they were putting bat boxes instead of spraying for the longest time. And they were killing the mosquitoes that way by eating them. And uh, so, yeah, so that's, uh, so they traded off all these concessions. They're there in writing as part of our settlement agreement, enshrined in federal law and locked away in some vault somewhere, or the equivalent of the electronic equivalent of it. And every year the city sprays, we raise the issue, we send it to them again. Uh, they don't spray as much. They, they, they're not spraying by airplane or helicopter. They definitely don't spray as much. I mean, people, the first two years, were people were sitting out in Queens eating in restaurants, and they were getting drenched in spray. And the organic food markets, were, their s merchandise was just being sprayed. And it just wrecked all sorts of things around the city. People were, not only people were being poisoned, uh, there was a fellow who works at WBAI Radio, where I was used to be the chair of the board there. And I interviewed, and I put it in the book, who was coming out just a couple of years ago, because uh, the book just came out this year. Uh, and he was coming home from work at 2 in the morning out in Queens, got drenched by the spraying. And he couldn't, you know, and he had asthma and had lung issues. And this, you know, he was trying to f run away from the spray, and there was no place to go. And it sounds a little farcical in a way because you don't think of these things as dangerous, but they come back, if not immediately, they come back over the years and pretty much haunt you physically. And it's one of a number of issues that were assaults, actually, on our bodies and our health that 
it's not only from spraying, but it's certainly a component of it. And one of the thing that one of the things that angers me personally is that this is never included in things like the Democratic Party's Green New Deal. So then the Green Party's Green New Deal, it included covering nuclear power, uh, pesticides, genetic engineering. In the Democratic Party's one, it's not covered at all. In fact, they go the opposite way. They think uh, 5G cell in the Green New Deal of the Democratic Party is promoted, saying this is a good thing. <laughs> it's insane because they think that will allow poor people even though it's not about poor people at all, to have access to, uh, or better access to computers. And it has nothing to do with that, but this is how they're selling it. And you just learn how they sell things. It's nuts.